thank you for attending the session on improving learning with systems thinking, anecdotes, and lessons learned. I'm Joe Casser. In this presentation, I'm going to share experiences and lessons learned starting about 1998 on enhancing online distance learning, thinking about how universities can team globally to enhance learning, a way of creating useful postgraduate degrees, and I'll share using magic in the classroom to enhance learning, particularly dealing with problems, and overcoming the defects of the flipped classroom, in particularly something I call the balanced classroom, and then a new life learning model that's post postgraduate. So back in 1997, I was facing a problem. I just joined University of Maryland University College, UMUC, and students were complaining about the difficulty of learning technical material in information technology and software engineering in asynchronous classes. An asynchronous class was a class where the students never met, everything was online. They had readings from textbooks or papers, they were supposed to read it and then do exercises. And all the dialogue was asynchronous, rather like posting on Facebook, LinkedIn, or Discord. And I needed to convert my first face-to-face -face synchronous class to asynchronous online format. And I also needed to create a new capstone class for the MSWE Master of Software Engineering degree for both online and face-to-face -face classroom. And I had less than a year to do it. So my conceptual solution was I would dissolve the problem. I would record the lectures. That way, the students would not have to get the material from the books and the readings. They would hear it just as if they were in the classroom. But the dialogue would be asynchronous using the existing infrastructure and emails. Although I did bring in voice over the internet for synchronous communications and local students could always use the telephone. The constraints were in those days Remember, we're talking about 1998, 1999. PCs were memory and speed limited. Disk storage was in megabytes, 10 megabyte hard drives, 20 megabyte hard drives. These days, files are larger than that. The internet data rates were about 1,200 to 2,400 board. And then there was network congestion, and that was out of our control. Internet wasn't as reliable as it was today, and you could actually watch and hear the network slow down at certain times of the day. So we needed to provide the capability to both view and download files, and the technology to create recorded lectures had to be affordable for both the instructor and the student. I also noticed that the technology used in a classroom and a conference presentation were the same. So whatever technology I used for asynchronous classrooms, I could also use for conferences. So I produced with Marsha Weisskopf a asynchronous conference presentation. There were a lot of vendors out there who wanted to sell me tools for creating my lectures. The most expensive was a whole studio. In fact, the university had studios for doing that. And so they invited the instructor to go into the university and record the lecture. But a lot of the adjunct instructors could not do that. Students definitely could not do that. So I looked around for equivalents that could be used at home and in the office. Everybody was using PowerPoint 95 for presentation graphics, and that came with Microsoft Office. So I found a shareware file transfer program called Qt FTP, really cheap. And then I found an audio editor out of Canada, Goldwave, and I've been using that ever since, and it's gone through various upgrades, and it's still being supported. In order to create my video files, I used a plugin to PowerPoint 95 called Real Presenter, and that enabled me to create videos, and I'll explain those in a little, in a little while. But when Microsoft upgraded from Windows 95 to the next version of Windows, Real Media stopped supporting that plugin for PowerPoint. Our browser and HTML editors were Netscape. I used an MGI Photo Suite graphic editor that was free. 
and a microphone was a six dollar device so it could all be done for 87.45 US dollars and if you didn't buy a real presenter it was less than fifty dollars. In 1998 a re an example of a recorded lecture was PowerPoint for the knowledge video and then there was a choice individual wave files for each slide which could be played while watching the PowerPoint slides and so it was bundled up in a zip file and transferred over the internet and played while watching the heart. Some of the students submitted presentations that way. Or they could record into PowerPoint. PowerPoint still has an option to record the presentation, but that creates a very large PowerPoint file. And in those days, it was really too large. A picture of the instructor shows up in the corner of each slide. No problem there. I could use real media, as I said earlier, and with real media, I could take those individual WAV files and embed them into the video. And then real media would create the RM file from those embedded audio plus the video. And a lot of the slides I'm using in this presentation, I've taken out of presentations I made at the time. Some of those presentations were even recorded, and you'll notice that little speaker next to the word format. If you see that up in the top left-hand corner of the screen, like you see it now, you'll note that that particular presentation was recorded. And to give you an example, a 55-minute video lecture from my class was only 3.3 megabytes. That's it, 3.3, not 350 or more. Most of that, I think, was because of the 5 kilohertz audio bandwidth. It was a voice lecture, so you didn't need any more bandwidth. To use asynchronous communications, I found a piece of software called Phone Free. It was very simple to use. Everybody who was in your contact list showed up on the contact list screen. You wanted to call somebody, you clicked on their name, and it called. Somebody called you, you clicked on the handset, and you had a conversation. In the online asynchronous class, students never met. So I offered them 1% of their grade if they submitted a photograph or a picture. Students could submit a picture electronically or a photograph that I would scan. The weekly lesson guide on the website allowed the students to watch Real Media streamed video, download the Real Media FTP file, or get a zipped PowerPoint and text. The results in CSMN 648 in the Master of Science in Computer Systems Management was like this. There were 20 students in the fall of 1998, Northern Hemisphere, two sections in the summer of 1999, which added up to 50 students. Some students liked the audio vi video better than text-based non-graphic classes. Some students want the text mode because they could read it while they're computing. Some students wanted the audio, and what they did was they recorded the audio onto cassette tape and listen to it while they were commuting. But students still thought synchronously, and the student behavior is similar in the online and the actual classrooms. And of course, as I said earlier, Simple Tools created the lectures. So after two years, I had a good Web Enhanced class page. You can see each of the classes, the class letter, the semester, a link to click to send me an email, CSMN 647, there's no link because there was no web assist at that time. Two of the classes were online, the rest were face to face. And if you clicked on the link to the class, you could go into that class page and download the notes. So if a few, very few smart students who were taking a class that had run earlier, went into the class and downloaded the notes and got ahead of the other students. 
and is a link to frequently asked questions and so on. Different version of class participation. Students can see each other. Here's an example class page for the software engineering class, the first time it ran. An overview of the class was it was a capstone course, it was a team exercise. Think of it as an examination. The instructor won't teach, the instructor is the customer. The students have to produce a product in the system development life cycle. They make their presentations, they produce the documents, and it all has to be manageable. If you think about teaming in the classroom, it's tougher than in government or in industry because the team has to be set up, bond, develop the process for collaboration, produce the product using the process, They've got 12 to 14 weeks to do it, and they have equipment compatibility issues. Some of them may use incompatible software. The whole world wasn't using Microsoft products at that time. And there were hardware issues as well. Some were using PCs, some were using Macs, and, and some were probably using one or two others. The schedule for the class was it didn't meet every week. There was a kickoff meeting, and then we had an operations concept review, a system requirements review, preliminary design review, critical design review, delivery readiness review, and customer acceptance test review. All my systems and software classes dealt with technical development, so forgive me if I lose you in the content. The presentations are all in PowerPoint 97, and you can see here that not every student had PowerPoint 97. Microsoft provided a viewer. And then for each session, session 3, 5, 8, session 11, session 14, the students sent me their package and I put it up on the website and the students could download it. There was no class in session 2, 4, 6, 7, 9, 10, 12 and 13. In the second iteration of the class, there were more student teams. There was one completely online team because there were students out of the Washington, D.C. area and they needed the class to graduate. Each milestone review would be presented using a mixture of synchronous and asynchronous techniques. And the formal presentations would also be done asynchronously via Web Tyco, which was University of Maryland University College proprietary online class format. The sessions would be face-to-face -face and via Web Tyco. This and the asynchronous views for all teams would allow the Web Tyco teams, that's the online team, to feel part of the entire class. The face-to-face -face teams had the choice of meeting face-to-face -face or using the online Web Tyco and other non-face-to-face -face techniques. The Web Tyco teams were prohibited from meeting face-to-face even though some team members would be in the local UMUC service area. I intended the early face-to-face -face meetings via telephone. The class ran and students completed their projects. There were a couple of teething problems initially, but it settled down. And then the students at the end decided they preferred asynchronous to synchronous. And there was little, if any, difference between Web Tyco and the face-to-face -face teams in terms of the quality of the products that they produced. And here you can see the teaching assistant setting up the class and the distance instructor, me, would come in on the telephone. After the last class, which contained demonstrations of the software, the students had a party. And you can see here a cake that they put together. You can see the cake, which is the keyboard, the mouse pad and the mouse, and some of the clippings that they put into the screen. They never actually sent me a piece of the cake. If you're interested in the grading, you can see that there isn't much difference between the grades. The first Web Tyco semester, there was a hiccup. But after that, the grades pretty much came into line. And in the two capstone courses, the grades were pretty much the same in the face-to-face -face class and in the web-assisted and face-to-face -face class. 
I'd like to talk now about a totally different approach to enhancing learning using global teaming of universities. There's a current problem that we had in the university which was low enrollment in a class. When that happens, the university cancels the class and advises students to take the class in a different location if it's offered. We had classes running in more than one location that's the same class in a different location, sometimes, not every semester, or take a different course because there was no real requirement to take the courses in any order. So the students had to forego the class or take it in a less convenient location or wait until it was offered again, which might possibly delay their graduation or take the class at another institution and transfer in the credits. Students were allowed to transfer in a maximum of two courses, but if they transferred in the credits because the university cancelled the class, the university wouldn't get the income. And the instructors would lose income because the classes would be cancelled pretty late, about a week before the class ran, and there wouldn't be time for the instructors to go find another class to teach. So I looked at three different collaboration models, institutional collaboration, customer contractor model, and a freelance instructor broker. And they're described in the paper I wrote on this back in 2000. But I want to just highlight the benefits of the customer contractor model. And the models are not necessarily incompatible. So in a customer contract model, you'd have an adjunct part-time teaching faculty only. The relationship between the university and the adjunct instructor changes from that of an employer-employee to a customer contractor, and so there'd be no full-time teaching faculty. The university would issue requests for proposals for course material usable both in the classroom and via distance education. It's win-win. The university benefits by collecting the tuition because the subject credit is not transferred in, there are fewer cancelled classes. Quality and timeliness of the subject matter is always current due to the competition. The instructor benefits by the greater earnings from teaching. The shared student experiences. I don't know about other instructors, but I learn a lot from my students because they work in different domains and different fields. And in some of the courses, some of those students knew more about the topic than I did because they had been working in that area for years and they were getting the piece of paper so that they could get promotion. The students benefit by the availability of the class when the student needs it, the availability of instructors from other areas, and that gives them a global experience because they work with other students across cultures and institutions. In UMUC, at various times, I had students not only from the U.S. In one class, there was a student from Egypt, and then the students in the U.S. military in different countries. And different corporations have different ways of doing things. Creating useful postgraduate degrees. So before I would create a degree, and whether I did this in Maryland, in UniSA, in South Australia, or proposed another degree in other universities, I would develop a better understanding of the need, document a traceable set of requirements for the courseware, traceable to what the students were doing in the workplace, develop a prototype set of materials, test the prototype in short courses or in parts of regular courses in several institutions, then revise the prototype materials into the final version. So there'd be four questions. In terms of product requirements, who are the stakeholders? It's not only the students, and often the students don't really know what they're supposed to know. It's the stakeholders who are interested in having the students take the degree and graduate. What should they be taught? The process requirements is how should the course be taught? And the design approach is what would it take to create a 21st century course that met the requirements? So the process for crafting a degree is take the stakeholder needs, the body of knowledge for the subject, and benchmark other universities and see what they're doing. This gives me the subject matter, the knowledge and skills that's needed. 
And then I want to know what factors make learning effective because I'm dealing with postgraduate students who are not the traditional undergraduate student because these people are in the workplace, they have families, they have other commitments, and so the learning should be made effectively. Consider the delivery mechanism that creates the pedagogy. Deliver the classes and then do some feedback, assess the teaching and learning results, and see how that updates what's going on the next time the class runs. The outcomes of the design process. Well, I did a benchmarking for the first time in 1999 when I was creating UMUC's Master of Software Engineering degree. I looked online and I found 15 universities in the US, three in Australia, and one in the UK that had a Master of Software Engineering degree. I noticed that University of Maryland University College Master of Software Engineering degree was better than most. And only UMUC's software engineering program had a course on software maintenance. And I found that strange because most of the project funds are spent in this phase of the system lifecycle. So why weren't there any classes on software maintenance? I also only found one textbook on the subject. And I changed the software independent verification and validation class from an elective to a required course because testing is also important. And I looked on their website while I was preparing this presentation and that capstone class is still running in the same format according to the class description. Not bad after 25 years. Watch the handkerchief. If you squeeze something, it, it compresses. But if you squeeze it hard enough, it compresses and disappears. So let's take this and squeeze it in my hand. Don't just look at his head, look like this. Other features. Other features. Okay, we're going to make it. Squeeze it, push it in, push it in. Squeeze it, squeeze it, squeeze it really hard until it just disappears. Wow! <laughs> Did you see where it went? I use this in discussing problem solving. The students were given the problem of what happened to the handkerchief, and then they had to work out possible solutions to that problem. And now I'm not going to tell you where it went. Overcoming the defects in the flipped classroom. Way back in 1997, when I was teaching my first class at UMUC, I noticed that students do not always read the session materials before the class session. The flipped classroom came about a few years later when some instructors recorded their lectures so that the students who missed the class would be able to watch those lectures online and catch up. And that evolved into the flipped classroom where the students were supposed to view those lectures ahead of time and the class could then be spent on doing exercises. But the assumption was that the students would read that material or view the lectures ahead of time. And that assumption is not. 100% true. So my partial remedy to make them read it was different. Each student was required to present the chapter associated with the session. So in the syllabus they had a listing of chapters out of the textbook or the readings and associated with that session. The grading would be stricter as the semester proceeded so there was an incentive to present in the earlier sessions and more than one student could present the same chapter. So we sometimes got two or three students presenting the same chapter in the session. Students had to elect which chapter they would present in the first session if they had the materials with them or by the start of the second session via email. The outcome was students had to read at least one set of session materials before the class I could focus the discussion on pre the presentations and the important points not presented by the students in their presentations. I could point out similarities and differences between the presentations that were made by the students. And this is important and often overlooked because different people reading the same material get different meanings out of it. And this is very important in development projects where if meaning is not shared 
the wrong product can be built and delivered. So the traditional process for creating a course was develop a statement of course objectives and learning outcomes, locate a textbook, create lectures, which could be the book chapters or personal experience or additional readings on the same topic, and then develop the class exercises and assignments. I looked up on the internet factors that make learning effective, and I found Dale's Cone and the Learning Pyramid. If you look at it, you can see that reading and the lectures are the worst way of learning something. Audio, visual, and demonstration are better, but discussing, practicing by doing, and teaching others for immediate use were the best. But those lecture classes down there, and what we should be doing, is up there, and other people would recognize it at the time, and so problem-based learning came into existence. And so this class became problem-based learning. And the result of all that lecturing was death by PowerPoint. So I wanted to create a class that reversed that. I looked around for a grant, and I could not find one in Australia, but I found one in the UK. So Phil John at Cranfield University and I wrote a grant application to the Levy Young Trust and we won a grant to develop such a course. And I moved to the UK to do it. The first time the course ran, there were eight students in the beginning engineering doctorate program. The students went into initial shock at the course workload because I introduced the class and then gave it to them to do. So most of the time was spent doing exercises. But the students cope with it. And learning appeared to be better than in the earlier lecture-centric classes. Day two in one of these classes was like day five at UniSA over the previous six years. The overall student evaluations were positive, and seven out of eight students recommended that other classes be converted to the format. How's that for student endorsements? What we were doing was a problem-based learning emulation of systems engineering. The lecture set the contacts and introduces the topics, and then everything was presentations, teaching, practicing by doing, and teaching others for immediate use. I did it again at the National University of Singapore in January and May of 2008 before I joined them as a visiting associate professor. In January there were 50 students, but in May there were only 15. A similar initial response was in Cranfield. Course workload overload, but similar improvement in learning. Similar daily student comments, overall evaluations were positive. In January, you can see this bunch of students smiling, and it is not a before picture, it's a during picture. Observation on the course is where it was a heavy course workload. It was a system engineering environment emulation, and I was trying to change the way the students thought. As I explained to them, at the end of the day, their brains hurt and my feet hurt because I was walking all the time, going from group to group and monitoring what they were doing and correcting them or changing their direction if necessary. The students' comments on the course workload were both positive and negative. Students were doing better on day two of, in this course than on day five in traditional lecture format courses. I mentioned that earlier. In terms of the quality and the content of the presentations and the type of questions posed. The questions coming from the students showed that they were using deep learning, which was very different to the traditional lecture format questions I was getting. I show it graphically like this. On day one, there was a range of presentations from bad to sort of. But by day two, everybody had moved up the scale. And by day three, the presentations were really good. And by day five, they were outstanding. But the workload was still high. And I sort of was reducing the workload and came up with what I call the balanced classroom. Looking at Bloom's modified taxonomy, the architecture of a classroom session is a lecture, ex traditional exercises, what I call knowledge readings and individual assignments. And the knowledge readings are the thing that overcomes the defect in the flipped classroom. So if you look at modified Bloom's taxonomy, you don't know what the students are learning from the lecture because there's no feedback. 
However, when the students do the traditional exercises of applying the knowledge they've learned in the session, they go through levels 1, 2, and 3 of Bloom's taxonomy. But when they actually get to the knowledge readings, they demonstrate the higher levels of analyzing, evaluating, and creating. And I'll share that in a moment. The exercises, students apply the knowledge, think about, and present what they've learned. So they're also doing a little bit of higher level Bloom's taxonomy. They take place in the context of an authentic representation of workplace and are consequently designed for what is called authentic assessment. And typical events are, a company has won a major contract for a new and exciting project. 50% of all technical and managerial staff applied to transfer to the new project. What are the students going to do about it? This is out of my class on project management. Or, the customer's budget has been reduced by 25% for the rest of the project. What's the impact on the project? Or the project manager was severely injured in an automobile accident and was on medical leave for 10 time periods. What are they going to do about it? Poor engineering resulted in delay of five time periods in the task requiring the most time. These provide the ability to handle open-ended, ill-defined problems, which is critical for project managers. It requires application of domain knowledge and cognitive skills, and it's sized for the workload the time the students are expected to allocate to the session. One of the things I found was students complained of workload, and then when we looked at what they'd done, we found they had exceeded the requirements. The students wanted to solve the problem, not do the exercise, which is laudable, but again, students are time limited. And also, in the real world, we don't have a large amount of time. We have to deal with the issues as they occur within the time that we have. And they can take place inside the classroom or outside the classroom, depending on the delivery mode. The knowledge readings, on the other hand, require the students working in teams to read the material assigned to the session before the session and then present a summary, a list of the main points, a description of one of the main points, and comment and reflect on the knowledge in the form of a lecture. And they've got five minutes to do the whole thing. It absolved the problem of designing exercises to allow the students to progress through the sixth level of the updated Bloom's taxonomy because they weren't applying the knowledge in this exercise. They'd done that in the traditional exercise. Here they were thinking about what they'd been learning. And the treatment of the knowledge reading advances the students through the higher levels of the updated Bloom's taxonomy. And the exercises only need to be designed for the lower levels and it demonstrates that different people perceive information differently. I've mentioned that before. And it enables the instructor to correct any misinterpretations as they arise. So when they're giving back the knowledge reading and they're giving back an incorrect interpretation of the knowledge in the book, the instructor can correct that right there instead of at the end of the semester in the exam. And it provides the st students with the opportunity to practice presentation skills and obtain feedback on content and style. And I tell the students, where would you rather mess up, here or in the work when you're presenting a presentation to your manager and perhaps customer? So here's a typical knowledge reading exercise. Prepare the knowledge presentation of reading 503. Formulate the problem according to a problem formulation template that they've been given. Summarize the content of the reading analytical skills, show the compliance matrix, another tool that helps them make sure they complete everything they're supposed to do and not do things they're not supposed to do. Show this slide in the version number of the lesson, list the main points. So now they've got to think about what they read and pick out the main points. Prepare a briefing on two main points. I do this because it gets boring if students are briefing on the same point. Brief on one main point only and then reflect and comment on the reading, compare content with other reading, and external knowledge. Bring something in that they've read on the same subject, and I get to learn something here as well. State why they thought the reading was assigned to the module, and summarize the lessons learned from the module, and indicate the source of the learning. Did they learn it from the readings, exercise, and experience? And you can see how it's weighted. The higher order Bloom's technology skills are allocated more time. 
And then if you add up the time, you find going from the bottom, 2 plus 2 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 is more than 5. So they've got to cut down. So they've got to decide which is important. What was the student reaction to this, apart from it's a lot of work? Let me share some of the evaluations. The three points that fit. The teacher has enhanced my thinking ability. I got a 4.5. The department average score was 4.2, faculty average score was 3.95. And down at number six, the teachers helped me understand how to apply knowledge. I got a 4.375, whereas the average department score was 4.1 and the faculty was 3.946. And the teacher has enhanced my ability to learn independently. I got a 4.5, department average score was 4.09, and the faculty was 3.9. And you can look at the numbers and you can see that my scores were higher. And my effectiveness rating was 4.625 as opposed to 4.2 and 3.9. Students liked to be challenged. They liked what they were learning. The comments were they'd learned more in my class than in several other classes using this technique. But the faculty didn't like it. Too much faculty work. The structural balanced classroom looks like this. The lecture is online or face-to-face, -face, but it's done before the class begins. The knowledge reading is set of the flipped classroom. The exercises are designed for authentic assessment and workplace emulation. And the assessment is based on individual assignments, teamwork, and something from each session. I learned this at George Washington University as a teaching assistant. I asked the students at the end of each session, to tell me what was the best thing about the session, what was the worst thing about the session, is there something they expected that was missing, do they have any questions that they didn't ask during the class, and any comments they wanted to make, I asked them to write it down on a piece of paper and leave it by the door on their way out. The lecture is pre-recorded, the flipped classroom approach, but it doesn't contain the knowledge in the readings, that's the difference. It contains additional pertinent knowledge and pointers to what's in the reading. And it may be, or it may include, a live or a virtual guest speaker. For example, in systems engineering, Professor Terry Kitchens provided some interesting and educational videos about systems engineering on his website. And in one class, he was even available by prior arrangement to accept and respond to students' questions after the presentation. Students loved it, and Derek had a good time as well. The classroom session began with a summary of the best, worst, missing questions from the previous session. It allowed me to recap anything, explain, and that gave me a lead-in to this session. The students then did the exercise presentations, each team presented, and then we had a break. And then the students did the knowledge reading, and again, each team presented. And then after each set of presentations, I was able to talk about what the students had presented, similarities and differences between them. And then came the lecture, and I could time that to fill the available time. And what I would do was I would flip through the slides, slide, slide, slide. If I wanted to, I can focus on specific aspects of the knowledge not mentioned in the session by the knowledge reading teams. And if any questions came up, then I could answer them right there and then. And then the class ended with my requesting the best, worst, missing question but feedback for the session. That has evolved into a new lifelong learning model. The delivery is very different to the traditional postgraduate class. First of all, it's not semester limited. There's no time limit. That one class has been running since December 2022. New participants can join in any time, and this means when they start listening to exercises presented by students who've been in the class much longer, they're exposed to knowledge that they may not understand, but they're getting the exposure and they can ask questions. It's a synchronous live weekly Zoom scheduled group session recorded for use as a resource. There's a lot of tacit knowledge that the students have that the instructor gives during these sessions that you won't find in the textbooks. 
It's the balanced classroom learning environment, so that there are exercises and knowledge readings. But it also allows participants to bring in their real-world discussions and get out-of-box experience from students in other applications domain. So if a student is having problems at work, they can discuss some of these issues and get feedback from the other participants. So there's more of a mentoring thing. And there's no way you can do this in a traditional semester mode because you don't have the time. S students learn by absorption, and that fast-tracks the learning and experience. One-on-one -on -one sessions are also available if the student wants to get together with the instructor at a different time, or come early, or stay late. There are asynchronous short lectures that are similar to the Bounce Classroom that highlight the important knowledge and tell them what to look for. There are also asynchronous discussions in a private link heading group. And this allows thinking time before responding. One of the very big advantages of asynchronous communication is there's time to think before responding. Do some research if necessary. You get notices of interest. There are conferences coming up. There are professional society meetings coming up, especially when they're online. Anybody can attend from anywhere. So students share that information. There are references to additional material of interest. This is another resource, and it's self-paced for the individuals. So if there's a work schedule conflict or a family conflict and they can't do an exercise that week, fine, no problem. Just have to make sure that students don't procrastinate forever and use a just-in-time learning approach. It's a good opportunity to expand one's personal network, and the instructor becomes the coach and a mentor, as opposed to a typical instructor who, once the class is over, the instructor disappears and you never see him again. And having a mentor and a coach available is worth at least $50,000. It's post-postgraduate, as I said. It doesn't fit into the semester or traditional cohort type of class. It's a hybrid of the master apprentice and the classroom educational models. It's more than book learning. And most of the value is in the program architecture and the interaction. However, most traditional academics without real-world experience could not lead this class format. Participants can join at any time, learning by immersion and iteration, lots of shared real-world experience in different domains. There's no firm ending date. It's a resource. It's lifelong learning. It's not for everybody. Every session is different. You can't do a lesson plan for the session because you don't know what the participants are going to present. Even though they said last week that they would do an exercise, something may have come up and they didn't. We could discuss a presentation. We could discuss a real-world problem. We could share experience stories. They're all different. The instructor needs to be knowledgeable, experienced, and able to guide the participants in reaching solutions, creating knowledge rather than telling. One of the benefits, actually, is there's no need to complete exercises before presenting it. The exercises are designed to emulate the real world of iteration. Some outstanding systems engineers prioritize and work iteratively until the schedule is exhausted. And this is what I'm teaching the students to do. The live classroom exercises are the only the first iteration. The students actually begin by spending lots of time to complete the exercise. And they need to learn to present work in progress, even when the way forward is clear. They can present the exercise over several sessions. They can begin by presenting an outline of what they're going to do, and get some feedback on it, and get some pointers. And, some, and we could work through that a few times, and by the time we've gone through the exercise three or four times, the students have learnt an awful lot, both from what they've done and the dialogue around it. They often don't need to complete the exercise because there's no re reason to complete the work once we've discussed it and suggested what needs to be changed. They progress quickly because they get feedback on the correctness of the content, presentation graphics, and the layout. It emphasizes iteration and repetition, best ways of learning, and sometimes alternate ways of presenting the information as dis are discussed. For example, should this information be in a bar chart or a Kvyat radar chart? 
and students can compare their presentations made in later sessions with those in earlier sessions. So they can go back and look at the recordings and see what other students presented in the same exercise a year ago and now two years ago. And so they get to see differences. Sometimes the instructor points that out. So in summary, I've wandered all over the place. I started off talking about enhancing online distance learning with synchronous and asynchronous presentations and some of the difficulties we had. I talked about global teaming by universities to enhance learning, creating useful postgraduate degrees, using magic in the classroom to enhance the learning, overcoming the defects in the flipped classroom and the balanced classroom and a new lifelong learning model. The details are in my published papers. They're accessible on my website, ResearchGate and Academia. And some of the recordings that I made in 1999 to 2002 have been loaded onto YouTube. And these are presentations I made at the time at the conferences using the technology to demonstrate the technology. However, they've been converted from standard to widescreen formats and from the real media format to the MP4 format. So thank you for listening. Any questions or comments?